So I want to give you just a, a brief introduction to our Torah reading today. Of course, we're reading Bereshit. We are at the very beginning of our Torah reading cycle. Uh, and some of the richest stories of our tradition. It begins on chapter 2, verse 4, with the second creation story and details about the Garden of Eden, including names of rivers that we still know of today. Uh, the second aliyah in chapter 2, verse 20, um, deals with the creation of woman from Adam's rib. They become as one, and they are naked. And I don't know about you, but every time I read this passage, I think of Yentl when she's telling her Hevra about its side, its side, not rib. Uh, the next Aliyah, chapter 3, um, begins is the entire story of the serpent, including the punishments of all of them for eating of the tree. There's so much to uh, unwrap about that story that we do year after year. Um, in chapter 3, starting at verse 22, we know that Adam and Eve is banished from the garden because they ate from the tree of good and bad. Um, they are going to be toiling for the rest of their lives, and, and both Eve and the serpent are all punished. Then we read in chapter 4 how Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. And this is the story, of course, where Cain murders Abel, and I'll be talking about that more in my Devar Torah. And then we have the beginning of the family tree of Cain. But then Adam and Eve have Seth, a third son, since Abel is dead and Cain was banished because of the murder. So our family line really continues from Seth. We also normally would read today our Haftarah for Shabbat Machar Kodesh, the special reading on the day before Rosh Kodesh, from the first book of Samuel, chapter 20, verses 18 through 42. We read the special Haftorah on the day before the new moon, signifying the new month. The first line, chapter, uh, book of, first book of Samuel, chapter 20, verse 18, says, Vayomer lo Yonatan machar kodesh. And Jonathan said to him, tomorrow will be the new moon, and that's why we have this reading. But even more interesting is the idea stated in our Eitz Chaim on page 1216, that machar kodesh the day before the new moon is considered a minor day of atonement. This is true every month, but in particularly for this month, for, for, for Cheshvan, having just gone through the High Holy Days, we are taught that we have the opportunity every Mar Machar Kodesh to atone again, to take an accounting for our actions. It is yet another new beginning. And this brings me to my Devar Torah this morning. Because Judaism has many beginnings, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Chodesh, Pesach. Today we find ourselves at the beginning of our Torah reading cycle as we read Bereshit, the book of Genesis. Every new year, with each new read, we bring our new selves to the text. We are in a different place now than last year at this time. We will read our familiar centuries-old text through a new lens. Last night I spoke about chapter 1, the first creation story, and the application of order onto chaos, the separation of light from dark. Today's triennial reading begins at chapter 2, verse 4. Here we have the second creation story that differs from the first in every way. Stylistically, it reads more like a fable, as opposed to the first creation story, which reads like a formal document. God creates Adam from the dust of the earth and blows God's spirit into Adam to bring him to life. God places Adam in the Garden of Eden with two special trees, the tree of knowledge of good and bad and the tree of life. God tells Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and bad or he will die. God doesn't say anything about the tree of life, which we will learn later in chapter 3 would make Adam an immortal being like God and the angels. So why does God give Adam a rule about one tree and not the other? Traditional commentators teach that having a single commandment, one rule to follow, gives Adam the opportunity to choose morality and obedience. Surely Adam can follow one law and not eat from one tree. But we see that that is not so. Adam does break the one rule, and he eats from the tree of knowledge, and he is punished for it by being kicked out of the garden. And he then has to toil for the rest of his mortal life. 
Another comment in our Eitz Chaim says that this is actually not a prohibition, but a warning. If you acquire knowledge of good and evil, life will become infinitely more complica complicated and painful for you than it is for any other creature. As Nechama Leibowitz teaches, good and evil here have no moral connotation in the sense of obedience to the will of God and its converse, sin. The reference is to a utilitarian good based on pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain. This is further explained by Bacha Ibn Pakuda in his Torah commentary. The tree of knowledge endowed those who ate of its fruit with desire and choice. In other words, according to Bachya, the tree of knowledge is really the tree of free will. The Almighty forbade it to man since the latter was destined, bef the latter was destined before the sin to act like an angel, patterned to be rational in all his ways. But after the sin of eating the fruit, man achieved free will and choice and became conscious of his bodily desires. This constitutes a divine and good quality in one way, but evil in another. And so it has be proven true. Our lives have become more complicated and painful. Unlike the beasts of the wild, we do not operate on instinct alone. Our free will, our ability to discern, to make choice, sometimes motivated by good intentions and sometimes motivated by self-interest, now must be tempered, and our natural human instincts to look out for ourselves alone must be guided and persuaded. We must now learn to look beyond our own selfish desires, our own greed, our own glory, to see what we need to do for the greater good, for our families, for our communities, and for our planet. The lesson about the tree of knowledge is about choice. We control our own actions. Unlike Adam, who blames Eve for causing him to eat from the tree, we know that we must take responsibility for ourselves. And sometimes the right answer is no. In the 21st century, we have a world filled with so many choices, so many options, so much to see, so much to do, so much to eat, and so much to read. So many people to know and spend time with, so much difference and diversity among so many cultures in our world, so many unique opinions and viewpoints. And in many ways, we are still at the beginning. We are still learning. We are learning how to provide for everyone. We are learning how to treat others who are different from ourselves. We are learning how to understand and learn from others' experiences. We are still learning to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are still learning that we, that we are each created but Selim Elohim in the image of God. We are still learning about humanity's impact on our physical environment. We are learning how to make choices not just in our own best interest, but again, how to make choices for the greater good. Perhaps this year, considering all that has happened in 5780, from climate crisis to racial divides to the coronavirus, we need to evaluate our choices. We have eaten from the tree. What choices will we make going forward? God asks us in this week's Torah reading to take care of the earth, la avda ul shomra, to till it and tend it, to guard it. Like our own shomrim who guard us in the synagogue, God tells us to take care of our planet, to keep it alive and to protect it. Then God tells us that part of our purpose is to be with other people. God says it is not good for man to be alone. We must find a partner, or perhaps in our modern understanding, a community. God created us to be social beings. Again, Nakama Limbowitz explains that the text says it is lotov, not good. And in the Hebrew, this is emphatic. It is not at all good, or the opposite of good to be alone. This means it is bad for a person to be alone. Leibowitz explains that a person cannot physically do all that he or she must do just to survive. 
The way our world is demands a division of labor and partnership. We work together, we build together, we create a family together, we pray together, we teach each other, we have extended family and friends, we depend on each other, we take care of each other and we protect each other. We make sure that people have food and clothing and shelter and medicine. We stand together against serpents who try to tempt us away from our better selves. We are taught this again in the story of the brothers, Cain and Abel, also part of this week's Torah reading. Cain and Abel each bring an offering for God. God accepts Abel's offering, but does not heed Cain's offering. In anger and in jealousy, Cain kills Abel. God questions Cain, saying, Where is Abel, your brother? And Cain responds, Lo yadati hashomer achi anochi. I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Here, like Adam, Cain takes no responsibility for his actions. He is given the opportunity to confess, and instead, like his father, he denies responsibility. Midrash Tahuma reveals that Cain goes so far as to blame God for the death of Abel, just as Adam blamed Eve for causing him to eat the fruit. According to Tanhuma, Cain says to God, I did slay him because you created in me the evil inclination. You are the keeper of all, and yet you allowed me to slay him. Had you, God, accepted my offering as you did Abel's, I would not have been jealous of him. We learn so much from this story. First of all, behavior, all behavior is learned behavior. It seems that Cain learns from the mistakes of his father and then repeats them. As parents, we are responsible for what we teach our children, both in words and in actions. Second, we learn that the difference between Cain and Abel's offerings wasn't just the quality. It was the effort that was put in. If we truly do our best with what we have, that is good enough. And finally, we learn that the answer to Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper, is of course, yes. Again, the Hebrew word for keeper is shomer, or guardian, the same word we saw when we talked about taking care of our planet. We are responsible for each other. We are meant to care for each other and make sure that we are all safe and secure. We lift up one another. We are there for each other in our time of sorrow and in our time of joy. God designed a world where it is not every man for himself. God says it is low tov. It is not good for man to be alone. We read over and over in the subsequent stories in the book of Genesis how we are supposed to treat each other. We learn, we learn over and over that selfishness, greed, greed, betrayal, dishonesty are not what God intended for humanity. In 5781, we need to take what we've learned and put it into action. We need to truly see each and every person as created in the image of God, worthy of love, care, and acceptance. We must do what we can to uplift all of humanity to be our better selves. We have the choice and the ability to make this happen. But do we have the will? Do we desire a better world, a healthy environment, and justice for all? I think we do. Times are hard, and we are challenged every day by the events happening around us. But it is precisely at these times that the words of Torah cry out to us. I am reminded of the words of Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor who wrote, We cannot change our circumstances, but we can change ourselves. In the coming days and months, let's take care of each other and let us do what is good.